So. <laughs> <laughs> you know who it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell them, tell them I'm coming. Don't tell them that. <laughs> chapter four is on understanding people's rights, and what's interesting about this chapter, believe it or not, um, Pearson View or Prometrius, they always send me. It's like a um a tabulation of how my students done. If I if I had forty students to test during the year, it'll say I had forty students to test, um, thirty eight pass, two fail. But out of everybody, even the pass and the failures, it tells me where my students score the weakest at. And do you all know where they score the weakest at? Understand people's rights. Understand their residents' rights. And I don't know why. It's simple. Every right you have, guess what? They have, they have it. It's very simple. But students always score low in their area. And it's because you got to be able to read the question, read what the question is asking you. Oftentimes, students would pick an answer and get it wrong. And they pick the wrong answer because the question is asking them about the resident. And they will pick the answer that will be right for them. Mm -hmm. Patient safety is always first. And when they're asking you a question about the resident, oftentimes you don't apply. They want to know what's safest for the resident, not you. Now, some granted, some questions are going to be about you. But if it's about the resident, the answer needs to be about who? The resident. Make sure you read the question when it comes to residents, okay? So, understanding le residents' rights. Let's talk about legal rights. In the early 1980s, they did a study on what residents need to feel protected. And this led to the passing of over 87, 87, the nursing home reform bill. Now, this reform defined residents' rights, and these rights are found in the Code of Federal Regulations, subpart B, requirements for long-term care facility, and they are described in this chapter. Now, the regulations are as such. The resident has the right to a dignified existence, self-determination, and communication with an access to persons and services inside and outside the facility. The facility must protect and promote the rights of each residence. Number two, a facility must care for its residents in a manner and in an environment that promotes maintenance or enhancement of each resident's quality of life. Number three, the facility must promote care for residents in a manner and in an environment that maintains or enhances each resident's dignity and respect and full recognition of their individuality. Now that's over 87. You also have the resident's bill of rights and there are nine of them. The first one is the right to exercise one's rights. Number two is the right to privacy and confidentiality. Number three, the right to information. What type of information you guys think we're talking about? Um, about uh, their personal information. Their personal information about their care. Yeah, doctor's orders, anything. They have the right to see it. Number four is the right to choose. What are we choosing? What provider you have. Mm -hmm. They have the right to choose facilities. They have the right to choose medication. If they don't want to take it. They don't have to. The right to notification of change. Protection of residents' personal funds, grievance rights, admission, transfer, and discharge rights, and the right to be free from restraints and abuse. Now, I always tell a story, and I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to tell it in a way that even though I'm being recorded, you can get what I'm saying. So, true story: I was working at the facility, and um, a resident had a phone that came up missing. So the sponsor came in and said, hey, I got my mom a new phone. The phone came up missing. He went to the room and he connected the phone and um, it rung and they asked for an employee. So he was like, hey, you know, I just connected my mom's phone. It rung and they asked for um, Sheba. So we like, we're looking at Sheba sideways. Did an investigation and, and Sheba had actually taken the phone and had been using it. So she was terminated. And I actually had to go to court, sit in front of the district attorney, um, the family, and everybody that was involved. And the family was basically like, if I knew 
it was gonna create all of this, it was a 1999 flip phone, I would have never said anything. However, when it comes to the district attorney and residence rights, if you take a piece of peppermint, you are going to be prosecuted. You're never supposed to take anything from the resident, ever. Money, peppermint. You may have residents that insist on you taking it, keep stuffing it in your hand, and you can't get away from them, and they just want you to have it so bad. But when you come out that room, you need to go to the nurse station and say, this Ms. Smith wouldn't let me leave without taking this. I can't take it. I'm going to put it on this. Turn it in, okay? So I was trying to tell that story to everybody to make it clear how serious it is. That was a little simple flip phone. So one day I'm working at, at the facility, and they said, Ruth, I think one of um, your students got in trouble or got terminated. I'm like, no, because I just didn't think so. Needless to say, the same story I just told you guys, she went down there and she took a resident's phone again and um got in trouble, got terminated. If it's, it doesn't matter what it is, you guys, you'll be prosecuted. Because people who are helpless or in a position of inferiority and you take something from them, does not make sense? No. Just like stealing from children. Stealing from the elderly is unacceptable. And at all costs, you will be prosecuted by the district attorney. They won't make an example out of you because they prosecute everybody. And now when things like that happen, you know who we have to call? The police. You have to file a report because somebody has been violated. Their rights have been violated. So, therefore, the police is called, a report is done, and then it's reported to the state of Alabama, okay? Very important that you know that. Now, the first portion is the right to exercise one's rights. There are two words I want you to put in your small book. Now, if you can use these two words in a sentence, you don't have to write them. But the two words are coercion and reprisal. Coercion means making someone do something against their will, often by a threat. Like if you tell Miss Smith, if you don't eat that bacon, you're not going to get in the water. Can't do that. If you don't eat that bacon, I'm going to push you out the bed. Now, reprisal is retaliation against or punishment of a person for doing something. Ms. Smith reported you to your supervisor. And because she reported you, you don't give her something to drink or you don't provide care as much as you should. That's considered... Now, that is retaliation. Now, reprisal is the same thing. Somebody phone going off, so that means it ain't turned off. Reprisal. Reprisal. Now, when it comes to the right to privacy and confidentiality, each resident has the right to confidentiality of their personal and medical records. Um, residents also have the right to privacy in their rooms by pulling the curtain and closing the door. Now, how do we protect residents' right to privacy? We don't discuss the residents' personal or medical information with anyone unless they have a legitimate need to know. We don't talk about residents' personal information with other residents, with relatives or friends. We don't talk about it with visitors, the news media, media or your own friend. What keeps us from talking about it is HIPAA. HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. These regulations determine how confidential health information should be handled and communicated. HIPAA is on page 46. I know everybody in here is familiar with HIPAA, right? Mm -hmm. I know. Now the right to information. The facility must inform each resident about their rights, okay? Each resident has the right to see their personal. We were talking about personal and medical records earlier. If a resident says, I've had a resident say, what you, you write about me? And I was like, yep, because I was documenting about the resident. And then he asked, can I see it? What do you think my response was? Yeah, he could yeah, see he it. He, see, he could see it. And I just slid the chart down so he could read what we had been writing on him. He could see it. He has that right. 
Now, residents also have the right to be fully informed in, wor in words that they can understand. I could go to you and say, hey, you have um, staph. You just got an infection. You don't want me to say you got methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. <laughs> you know, you want to break that staph. But who uses that word? We're going to break it down in terms that you can understand. You also have to give residents a copy of their rights. They have to sign it. Now, another person that you guys need to know about is the ombudsman. That's on page 49. You see that sign? The ombudsman is a person required by law to investigate complaints by the resident or other violations of law. You got a small book or... Violation of rights. You can put in your regular notes. Long you need to know who they are, though. The ombudsman is an advocate for the residents. When they have issues that they can't resolve or they feel like... um. Something is going on they can't correct. They oftentimes call the ombudsman to help them out with that issue. Right to choose. What are we choosing? Residents have the right to choose about the living arrangements and medical care as long as their choices do not interfere with other residents' rights. They have the right to refuse treatment. They have the right to choose their own personal doctor. They have the right to share a room with their spouse. They have the right to take medication by themselves if the treatment team thinks it's safe, okay? Write the notification to change. If there's any change in their diet, medication, the residents have a right to be notified. The facility must keep updated addresses and phone numbers of each resident's legal representative also, okay? Question so far. Now, personal funds. Residents do have the right to keep and manage their personal funds. Most of the time, they don't have over $50 on them. But why would they keep $50 on them? You know how, who went out and bought lunch today? Right, you went to Applebee's, you went to Domino. The resident could have had $50 and said, hey, would you um bring me a piece of bag from Domino's? Nothing's wrong with that because they have a lockbox. Most of the time, they're going to wear a bracelet with a key on it, lock their money up. If you're going to go and get it, you get a witness, you go in there and get the money, bring them the food back with the receipt, give it to them, lock it back up, and that's how that works. So they oftentimes do have money on them so they can do stuff like that. But if they have more than that, It'll be downstairs with the business office locked up, and she basically treats it like a bank. If they request request money, she'll bring it up, and then they'll sign out for the money, okay? It's our responsibility to do what's ethically right when it comes to their funds. We were talking about that earlier, okay? Now, grievance right. What's a grievance? A formal complaint. Do residents have grievances oftentimes? Yeah, they complain about the food. They complain about the care. They complain about the hair color. They complain about the person they got in their room. They complain about sunlight. You know, they just have issues. And that's their right. But when they have a grievance, we write it down so we could try to fix it. It's a form of complaint. Now, when they do file a grievance, they have to be able to file a grievance without fear of retaliation. If I tell you Miss Smith um, filed a grievance on you, she said you were rough, she said um, you pinched her, just whatever. That it is what it is. I got to send you home. You're going to be suspended while we investigate. Because if you didn't do it, you'll come back with pay. But what if you actually did it and I don't send you home? This lady who has caused harm to Miss Smith is basically walking around. So she's still probably in fear, correct? So that's what, right. So that's why when something happened and a resident makes an allegation, they will send you home so you won't be a threat. So patient safety is always what? First. First. That's why you go home. And then if it's not substantiated, you come back to work and you get paid for the time that was missed. Okay? Questions? None? Have you ever had that Absolutely. I cried. Because it hurt your feelings. Even though yeah. you, it, it, I was. I can remember just man said I called him a B I T C H. 
on the way out of the room. Walking out, and I looked back and said that word. But I had somebody with me. And so that young lady was able to say, no, she didn't say that. But even though she was there, because it was an investigation, they sent me home. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had dementia. How do you think well, it's it's like you go through that care plan because a lot of times when people make allegations that are not true, they have a care plan called um, unfounded rumors. Basically, when they don't tell the truth. And so you're able to prove that, hey, this happens a lot. And they have a diagnosis of dementia or you have to have supporting documentation. That's why we were talking about the chart getting cumulative because you should have a care plan for unfounded rumors and then you should have a care plan for dementia or Alzheimer's. Then you should have nurses notes um, supporting the unfounded rumors. And when people make um, threats and different things, you have to make sure you document. So if your documentation is good, that's how you substantiate that. And that's what they do. They send that to the state. And you're able to create a picture of what's always happening. Your chart should paint a picture of whatever type of care is being provided, okay? Through your nurse's notes, through your behavior forms. It's important when people spit, when they hit at you, when they use profanity, that you go and actually document. And if you can create a pattern of this behavior when stuff like that happens, you have proof. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Admission, transfer, and discharge rights. Residents have the right to know when they're being transferred. They have actually discharges. They do like 30-day discharge plans. They call you in and say, okay, in 30 days, you're going to be discharging. We're going to start working on this. And there's actually one person that handles discharges because when you're going home, they're going to order you everything you need. They'll meet with you two weeks prior. This is the goal. We meet 30 days. Then three weeks, okay, are we on target to go home? Then two weeks, are we, and that's how it should work. And when they go, we send all medicine with them, everything they had in the room. You should have companies coming in to set up whatever equipment they need. It has to be a safe discharge because, believe it or not, when you're discharging, the social worker has to make sure everything is done right because it'll kind of be a reflection on her. You want to, you, you have to make it safe for them to go back into the community. And if it's not like if you send somebody in the community and they don't have oxygen already at the home, is that safe? No. no. So those are the type of thing you have to make sure they are in place. Okay. Questions. We almost done y'all. So let's talk about, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about abuse. Abuse is important. It's, up until recently, I swear to God, I won't tell y'all no lie, I never work with people who are abusive. And so when, when people talk about abuse, I was like, don't nobody abuse residents. That just don't happen. But guess what? It does happen. It does happen. It One story I saw um, that... I read a story online. It was a, I made notes about it. Let me look. In 2011, an 82-year-old woman, she was found in a dark, smelly room. Her body had grown into the couch Ooh. and the blanket covering her wound. So the wound, the blanket, and the couch was one. Her 51-year-old daughter and her caregiver, it says six weeks later, I don't know what that means. But anyway, she she had an ulcer. She was swollen and covered in maggots. So she was laying on the couch. You know how the couch print did on your hip? Mm -hmm. Her, the couch, and the blanket was one. She had been laying in feces for so long. So I'm sure when they lifted her up, they left some skin on the couch. She had maggots in the womb. And researchers will say that the maggots probably what was keeping her alive because they were eating the dead, infected flesh. But six weeks later, that's what happened. She died. So when she died, do y'all know what they did? They prosecuted. They prosecuted. It was her caregiver and her um her daughter, I wanna say. Now that's that's like devastating for somebody to lay on the couch 
so so. And what was the kid doing? What was her job? Just feeding them. I don't, I don't think they were doing what they wanted that check, probably. Yeah, they, 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 Another story. You don't think that you know, okay, you want a check, but that's your freedom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, abuse is so real. Another story Um, in Trustville. Y'all heard of Trustville? Mm -hmm. Alabama. It was Trustville Health and Rehab. Um, You could actually put it in your cell phone. And the state survey will pop up. Because at Trustville Help and Rehab Health, a man went in to see his mom, right? Mm -hmm. And seeing they walked in, when she walked in, he had his pants unbuttoned. Mm -hmm. So she backed out. Mm -hmm. And a nurse came in. When a nurse came in, she saw his pants down. And his mom uncovered her perineal area. So she came out. She came out to go get the supervisor. The supervisor came back. Three people came, and they all backed out. Nobody intervened. Nobody stopped. Nobody said, what are you doing? Nobody said anything until that fourth person came. Three people left this patient in harm's way. He was in there having sex with her. He was having sex with her. He broke her hymen. I read the whole report. She had bruises on her labias. He broke her hymen. His keys were up under her. When the police came, he was intoxicated. And then he told the police it started out innocent. His mom was just providing him with comfort. And that led to penetration. I was confused, but that's what the report said. They closed the whole facility down. They closed their house, and they had to um, ship those residents out to other facilities because when those three employees came in, the first person was supposed to stop mm -hmm. and keep her safe and call for help. You never leave a patient alone. You always provide comfort and provide safety. So when safety is not first, then there's an issue, okay? Mm -hmm. But this is a sentence I came up with, kind of a way to remember the different types of abuse. And the sentence is, because it's multiple types, misappropriation is always physically, sexually, mentally, verbally, and chemically abusing me. First off, misappropriation, it looks like miss. You sleep or your eyes still burning? <laughs> so misappropriation is misappropriation of property and residence funds. That's basically stealing. So if is involuntary seclusion. That's when you put a resident in the room with no stimulation, no television, no nothing. Physical abuse is hitting them. You know what sexual abuse is. Mental abuse, verbal abuse and chemical abuse this is all different types right here okay and then restraints we don't use restraints any longer not in long-term care we cannot use them cms cms will not allow us to use restraints okay next thing you need to know about is the elder justice act of 2010. now this is what the elder justice act is the guidelines state that if a worker has reasonable suspicion that a crime has happened involving a resident or a person receiving care, that is your responsibility to report it to both the police and the state of Alabama, okay? You have to report it without fear of retaliation. Now, the act also says that if there is serious bodily injury, you have to report that within two hours. Any other suspicion of abuse is required to be reported within 24 hours. In most facilities, the abuse and neglect coordinator is going to be the administrator, okay? But if you suspect abuse, who do you report it to? Nurse. The charge nurse. She then in tell is going to report it to her supervisor, who then is going to call the administrator, okay? You have multiple types of abuse. Look on page 55. Two words I want you to make sure you put in your small book is neglect and negligence. Neglect is failing to do something that you should have done. Neglect includes not giving proper hygiene, care, not turning a resident over in the bed to improve their circulation, 
not giving food or water on a regular basis, not taking the resident to the bathroom when they ask. Neglect may also be considered physical abuse. Now, negligence. Negligence is failing to act in the same way that a reasonable person with the same training will act in the same situation. Gross negligence is an action that shows no concern for the resident's well-being, okay? Direct abuse is calling a resident a disrespectful name, screaming at the resident for being incontinent. Indirect abuse is making an indecent finger gesture like this. That's indirect abuse. Ma'am? Yeah, all of us on page 55. Neglect and negligence. They should be highlighted. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so in this chapter, we got residents right. We have nine of them. Reprisal, a retaliation against a punishment of a person for doing something. You have coercion, making someone do something against their will, often by a threat. The ombudsman is a person required by law to invest investigate complaints by residents or other violation of rights. Yeah, I'm just going over it for the um recording. Now, different types of abuse. You have physical, chemical, verbal, sexual abuse, mental abuse, corporal punishment, involuntary seclusion, and theft. The Elder Justice Act of 2010 is guidelines regarding reporting requirements for any suspicion of a crime or abuse against an older adult. Now, if you think there has been serious bodily injury, you have to report it within two hours. Any other suspicion, you actually get 24 hours. Okay.